it's um, uh, the thing that's been interesting, even though development platform is not really fully um, announced and released, um, the, the world of startups has been sort of discovering it, and lots of people are realizing that um, uh, there are ideas that they may have had in the past which just couldn't realistically be implemented, which they can now actually implement and build companies from and so on. And there's a, a whole stream of startups. It's actually, the, it started as a trickle and is now becoming more of a, a, a gusher of startups contacting us to say that they're, that they're going to build their, their, um, uh, their companies on our technology stack, which is, which is really nice to see. And that's happening through our development platform uh, system. Now, one of the questions when, when you say um, uh, start off with a small piece of code that you write in Morphin language and then deploy it, uh, you know, will this scale up? If you, if you end up having a website where you put it up and a million people come to it uh, the first day you put it up, um, will, it, will it actually work? Well, this year we, we ran a couple of tests of, of what will actually happen. So we had a couple of, couple of things like, for example, this year was um, a Pi Day of the century, you know, 31415 uh, date. Um, and so um, uh, we put up a, a website that was actually extremely trivial. It's a tiny piece of Wolfram language code. Um, and this is a website where it computes, you know, uh, where your birthday occurs in the digit sequence of pi. And then you can generate a t-shirt with, um, with the requisite uh, uh, stuff on it. Um, and uh, this was, um, um, this is a it's, a, it's a very small piece of code. And, um, uh, Probably um, oh, this is uh, it's just a blog I wrote about it, but um, um, the uh, let's see where the where the the code is pretty much here, um, and uh, uh, most of the code is involved with making the graphics um, and uh, and and um, and setting that up. But uh, in any case, so we put this this out on Pi Day, and a million people visited it in the first day. And the site worked fine in that particular case because it was our very first test. We had some issues with logging some of the things that were happening on the site. Um, but uh, then a couple of months later, we put up our image identify website that I showed earlier. And again, uh, a million people visited the, the first day, and it worked perfectly, um, even though it's actually doing a much more sophisticated computation. So this gives us uh, uh, being able to do these kinds of tests is important because it means that um, uh, people who build their companies based on development platform can expect that if a million people come to their site the first day, it's actually going to work. Um, so that's uh, um, so. Uh, actually, we could we could take. Um, uh, What's that? Yes, that's right. That's right. This is American Pi Day only. Um, What's that? No, we haven't done a European Pi Day. We were considering there was also a Tau Day on 628. Um, we did an analysis, though. We looked at uh, all papers on the archive um, uh, preprint server to try and analyze when Pi occurs, does it usually occur as 2 Pi or not? And actually, Pi is the winner. It's uh, 2 Pi is not, uh, it's, it's not the case that Pi always comes uh, combined with a 2. Um, it might be, but you know, it's something you can get by analyzing all of that, all of that textual data. In any case, the, the, um, so, okay, let's talk about, um, uh, so, so with development platform, you get to deploy things in a lot of different ways. You can deploy not only uh, to the web, but also to mobile. Um, under, uh, we have the Wolfram Cloud app, which is a free app um, that allows you to deploy, um, uh, uh, which, uh, which allows you to access notebooks, you can do a whole um, Wolfram language computation if you want to. Let's see, I'm, I'm going to run out of time here, so I, but let me just, um, uh, let's see, here we go, let's go to the cloud, and let's go here, oops, can you see the top of that? Maybe, um, I can go and I can say create new notebook, and now on my iPad here, come on, wake up. Um, I can be saying make a new cell, Wolfram language input, and now if I want to, I can go, you know, compute whatever I want to compute, um, one, two, three, four factorial, and now this is running. Uh, this is running against the cloud, but this is now running directly inside my. Um, uh, uh, this this is now running the interface in the iPad. Um, you can also deploy forms and so on to the iPad. 
Um, you can deploy them. You can even, to my surprise, you can even do Wolfram language programming perfectly well on a phone, um, which is kind of neat. Um, you can also deploy these things to things like the Apple Watch. And like when the Apple Watch came out, I, I spent a, a day writing a bunch of apps for the Apple Watch. Um, they're a little bit uh, stunted because there's a, the input is kind of difficult on a, on a watch. But there are plenty of, uh, plenty of interesting apps that are just purely sort of situational um, that, uh, uh, that, that um, can, can run on a watch. Well, when you talk about deploying things, um, the, the, uh, we have our public cloud, um, which is kind of the, the way that the open cloud is set up and sort of the first place you deploy to um, uh, with development platform. Uh, the other thing that we have um, that's now in, uh, uh, we have a, a, a limited release of, and it will be coming out as a sort of full release soon, is our private cloud. Um, and we are able to take um, all of the sort of cloud technology that we have and package it up to deliver a virtualized private cloud that can either be run inside generic infrastructure like uh, um, Amazon or can be run in an on-premise uh, solution or can be run in actual hardware that we provide. Uh, private cloud turns out to be, um, uh, it's both of, of, of great practical use to people who have large kind of corporate deployments that they want to do. It's also relevant if you're worrying about HIPAA compliance and various kinds of um, uh, uh, confidential data kinds of things. Um, there are also many uh, practical reasons for using private clouds. For example, one of them is if you have a big piece of code um, that uh, uh, you're running APIs against, you want that piece of code to be, you want the kernels that are running it to always be pre-warmed. So if the thing, if you're loading in a gigabyte of data um, to be able to do those computations, um, you, uh, 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 you, you, if you were doing that on the public cloud, you will be sharing the, the, the nodes with lots of other users and your gigabyte would not be loaded in until somebody actually requests um, an API. But if you have a private cloud, you can pre-provision um, uh, all of those uh, kernels so that they can instantly run um, uh, with, with your gigabyte of, of, um, uh, of initial data. Other kinds of things you can do in private clouds, you can do things like access external programs in private clouds that we won't let you do in the public cloud the, the, you, where you can actually access you know, pieces of raw C code and so on. The other thing you do in a private cloud is run a continuous task. So for example, if you noticed our Twitter program website um, where, we're, uh, where you send a, a um, uh, a tweet to um, uh, a, a, a Twitter handle, um, and we'll compute the, um, uh, the, the the tweet as a piece of Wolfram language code that's less than 140 characters long. It's remarkable how much you can get done in 140 characters of Wolfram language code. Um, you send the tweet, and it's picked up by a, a server, um, which then does the computation and sends back a, a, um, a, a picture of the result. Um, that's an example of a continuous task running in a, in a uh, private cloud. Um, and that's the type of thing that you can do is just run continually in a private cloud doing things like that. So, so, another, so among the ways to deploy system, uh, there's deploying in the public cloud, there's deploying in a private cloud, there's deploying it for mobile. Um, you can make, in, under iOS, you can, you can deploy into the, uh, our Wolfram Cloud app. Um, on Android, you'll be able to deploy directly into a, a standalone app um, that can access our cloud. Um, the, um, uh, I might also mention something which is coming after a very long time is uh, a CDF player for iOS. Um, being able to have um, local CDF running um, completely on, um, uh, on, on, an, uh, on an iOS device. Um, that's been a, that, that's another, you know, basically, we, we used to, many, many years ago, we had different front ends um, for Mathematica for different platforms, Windows, uh, you know, X Windows, uh, uh, Mac, and so on. And then uh, sometime in the 90s, all of those different front ends got merged into a nice, elegant um, software stack. Um, now we're back to the past again because um, there's now completely separate user interfaces that have to be provided for the web, running through JavaScript and through browsers, um, and running under, um, uh, under iOS and on mobile platforms. The, the world of front ends has fragmented again, and so we have ended up uh, building these large software stacks uh, that service each of these different um, 
types of interfaces. Probably at some point in the future we'll be able to merge these again, but what typically happens in these situations is that the capabilities of these individual user interface environments aren't great enough to let you do anything good without having really native code um, in, in those particular environments, and so we have to build that native code. So, in any case, the, the, so another sort of deployment channel is um, uh, the, um, uh, through CDF, uh, native CDF and, uh, on, on mobile devices. Um, so another, another deployment channel is through, um, uh, for example, the shell. So for example, you've always been able to say since 1988, you've been able to you know, go to, uh, just go to a shell and start typing things in. Um, and that all still works. And it's useful that it works because in a lot of the, uh, a lot of kinds of um, uh, environments now for IO, Internet of Things devices and so on, this is important, something that's coming soon is the thing where you can just type Wolfram dash cloud dash code, and then we can say something like, I don't know, 100 factorial or something. And what this will do is it will uh, run, uh, it's been authenticated, this, this script has been authenticated here, and now it will simply run against, um, uh, against the cloud, it will run the piece of code 100 factorial. Um, and so, can you edit in a shell? No, you can't edit there, can you? Um, I don't even know how to do this. This is a, okay. So, um, you know, you can, you can go ahead and, um, uh, um, you know, you can go ahead and do whatever you want to do. But, but um, uh, what's, what's relevant here is that you can basically write a shell script um, that will access our cloud. And if you have an API that's deployed in the cloud, you can access that, uh, that API function directly from a, a, uh, a command line shell script that you can put into another program. Um, now, you can also take this, and by removing the word cloud there, we can actually run this locally against a local kernel running on this machine. Um, we can set it up in a variety of different ways. We can either have a pure local kernel running on this machine. We can have a, a server that's running on our local network, that's serving, uh, that's providing Wolfram Engine for a bunch of different machines. Or we can go to a private cloud, or we can go to the public cloud. And the point is that these are all kind of transparent types of things to do. You just change some option, and you're going to a different place. Um, the, uh, so just to talk about, if you write a piece of Wolfram language code, you deploy it in the cloud. You, um, uh, you can deploy it in these different places. One of the things that's coming is a Wolfram engine that is an embeddable Wolfram engine, where you can take that code, and you can simply have a Wolfram engine that runs as a dynamic library connected to um, your uh, existing program in whatever language you, you're, 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 you're using. Um, and then you can, um, uh, with the exact same interface, you can call, um, you can call the engine when, when, when you need to, to do all from language computation. Okay, so this, is, uh, so this is some of the things that are coming with development platform. Um, one of the, the other thing I, I had mentioned in, um, on the front page here is programming lab, completely different direction. Um, so development platform has to do with people creating production code and uh, production systems and starting companies and those kinds of things. Um, another great opportunity that, we have, opportunity that we have is to teach computational thinking and programming to people. I think we have now a unique moment um, to try to do that because with Wolfram Language, we've got a language where a lot of the sort of all of the, all of the grunge work has been automated and we've got to the point where we can really be talking about computational concepts and doing real-world kinds of computations uh, very quickly. And this kind of gets one to the question of um, uh, sort of how does one teach programming? How should one teach programming uh, with Wolfram Language? What would the world be like if everyone could program? Interesting, interesting questions. And programming, people still think when we talk about programming, they think about either writing scratch code or writing JavaScript code. Neither of which, both of which I think will remain and probably increasingly be, be well, scratch is a different issue, but, but with JavaScript code and so on, these will be specialized activities. Just like people, they will be the assembly code of the future. Um, people don't write assembly code anymore um, because there are higher level languages. These kinds of things will be the assembly code of the future. And what will, uh, uh, one will always be, uh, the, 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 what, what's important about Wolfram language is that we're trying to take things to the point where you are as precisely as possible describing uh, 
what you want to do, you're not telling the computer how it should do its work. You're simply describing what you want to do, and then it's up to us to figure out the automation to get the computer to do what you want. And that's, that's a form of communication um, that I think is, a, is, a, is, a, is, is the sort of surviving an important form of communication. I mean, I view it as being, at a very global level, I view it as kind of being a, uh, this idea of knowledge-based language is sort of a, the, the next step in the progression uh, of which uh, human natural language was kind of the previous step. It's something where we're now able, with human natural language, it's a great form of communication, um, but uh, it has the feature that, uh, you know, when, when one person talks to another, the, 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 the receiving brain still has to process, has to absorb the natural language. It isn't something where it can immediately execute um, what is described in natural language, that sort of process of absorption that has to be gone through. Um, with, with a computer language, um, one is able to sort of directly communicate um, and immediately execute um, what is communicated. Um, and that's something that I think is, is going to turn out to be a really pretty profoundly important thing that's, that's, uh, uh, that's happening now. Um, and you know, with Wolfram Language, we for the first time got a language which can actually talk meaningfully about things in the world, not just about sort of abstract moving data from register to register, but about um, actual practical objects in the real world and so on. In any case, one of the things that's neat is that, uh, in a sense, the, the uh, um, kids don't have any disadvantage relative to sort of the world's sophisticated uh, R&D folk in understanding uh, how to program um, in, in this kind of knowledge-based language. And so I think there's a great opportunity right now to teach the, 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 the coming generation, so to speak, um, how to think in computational terms and how to program with Wolfram Language. So the next question is how to actually do this? How do you actually um, try and uh, teach Wolfram Language? Well, we have a, a thing we call Wolfram Programming Lab, which will be available both um, uh, in the cloud and um, uh, um, and on the desktop, and um, it, it has two basic branches. Um, one is what one might call immersion language learning, and uh, one is kind of more structured language learning. So sort of in the immersion language learning mode, um, here's a piece of code that works, modify it in some way, see what happens. Um, if you really want to, you can read the details of how the thing works. You keep going here, you try to understand more, you try to go through and go further and so on. Um, this, is, uh, this is set up to be um, a, uh, a way of just exploring the language where, where you're just starting from examples and, um, uh, and, and, trying to, um, uh, and trying to get interesting things to happen. Well, uh, the, um, uh, another approach is sort of a more structured approach to learning the language. I mean, the immersion approach when one learns human natural languages, you know, immersion is you go to country X and you don't talk English anymore and you try and understand what's happening in the, in the native language. Um, an alternative approach is more the way that people, you know, learnt Latin and things like this where, where you have a more structured kind of uh, textbook type approach. Um, and one of the things that, um, uh, so one of the questions then is, you know, something like mathematics has had, you know, a thousand years to figure out the sequence in which one can teach things. For computational thinking and programming education uh, with you know, the kinds of capabilities of the Wolfram language, we're basically at, you know, t equals zero for that, um, for figuring out how to do these kinds of things. So we have to figure out everything from scratch. So I thought this was an interesting challenge. Um, and so, uh, uh, and actually I've been sort of hoping that some, some other folk would write kind of introduction to Wolfram language books um, and things like that, but it hasn't happened. Um, I myself was off books for a long time because as many of you may know, I. I spent a decade writing one particular very thick book, which got finished in 2002, and that kind of put me off books for, for a while, because a decade is a, is a long time to, to be doing a project. Um, but uh, I decided about three months ago, I decided, okay, there really needs to be a, a sort of elementary Wolfram language book. And so I sat down and I wrote one, and it's, it's almost finished, and that's the, this, it looks finished, but the, this is just, it'll, it'll go to the printers in a week or so. Um, this is, uh, uh, it'll be available in sort of all possible formats, free online and so on. Um, in fact, this site is now live and you can take a look at the preliminary version of it. Um, the, uh, it's sort of interesting that um, 
uh, you know, the kinds of things that, I don't know, there's a pretty early section seven is about colors and styles, and it kind of, uh, you know, there's a question of in what sequence do you teach Wolfram language, and by this point, one's got enough information that one can see, you know, how to do, you know, blending colors and making tables of colors and so on, and uh, then there are exercises. I myself have never really done exercises in any book ever in my life, but I tried to write these exercises, and I'm, I'm really interested in feedback that people have um, about, about these exercises. Um, the, uh, some of them are uh, interesting things happen in the exercises. Um, I think um, the, uh, uh, what's, what, you know, the, the sort of sequence of what one gets to talk about in Wolfram language is sort of not perhaps what you would expect for programming education. For example, you're going through here and you're doing you know, graphs and networks and you've got all kinds of, all kinds of interesting graphs coming out and so on. Um, and uh, you've got uh, all sorts of things about, um, I don't know, um, uh, you know uh, uh, functional programming and nest lists and all this kind of thing. And all this happens and is, um, uh, is, is um, uh, is, is being talked about. By the way, I should say that this book um, is a completely non-math book. It doesn't mention algebra. It mentions algebra only in the section on things we haven't discussed at the end of the book. Um, and uh, so, for example, it doesn't mention plot. It mentions list plot by about section two, but it doesn't mention plot. Um, and uh, it's, it considers taking a power of a number to be sort of a somewhat sophisticated operation. Um, but nevertheless, it gets pretty deep into things like functional programming and so on. And interestingly, I realized that assigning names to things, that is setting values for variables, occurs in section 38 of the book. And before you ever get to assigning values to variables, you've uh, deployed websites and created mobile apps and all kinds of things like this, which is sort of interesting in view of the kind of the, um, what people traditionally think of as what programming is about. You know, I was looking because it happens to be about to be Ada Lovelace's 200th anniversary or something, I was looking at the very first program written by Ada Lovelace. Actually, I don't understand. Line four appears to be wrong, so I'm kind of stuck there. But um, uh, that program was a thing that was moving, moving data around to registers. Those were registers that were hoped to be made in the analytical engine made of you know, brass and so on. But basically, a lot of what people are teaching in programming education is extremely similar to what was in the original Ada Lovelace program, moving data around from register to register. This is not what computation is about. Um, the, uh, uh, and you know, I think what we get the opportunity to do is to kind of define what, what computation really is about and how to think about things in computational terms. Um, and I've tried to make sort of one pass at how to do that um, uh, in this particular book. I might mention that the template for creating this book, we now have a pretty good template um, in uh, Wolfram Notebooks for creating this book, and we'll make this template available. And uh, uh, this, this, book is, um, this book should not be the only book of its kind. And there are, you know, for example, there's, a, there's, there's many obvious books uh, that, for example, do mention math, for instance, um, that, uh, uh, that need to be written. Well, okay, quickly going through some other things that we have on the way. Um, also on the way, in terms of uh, uh, general platforms, is our data science platform. That's really emphasizing the idea of going from a data source through analysis to generating reports. And we have very flexible ways of both ingesting data from a lot of different sources and generating uh, uh, different kinds of reports. Uh, data science platform probably will be out mm, end of this year, beginning of next year, I think. Well, let me talk about um, other kinds of technology we've been working on quickly here. Um, so a lot of stuff to do with connected devices. You know, we had started a couple of a year and a half ago our connected devices project, just inventorying all the different weird kinds of connected devices that, um, uh, that exist. Uh, something that came out uh, this year is Wolfram Data Drop. This is a very useful thing. The idea of it is it's a, a universal accumulator of data from things. Um, and by things, I mean, well, there's a web API. There's, you can send things on Twitter. You can have embedded code. You can send things from Arduinos. Um, you can send things from all sorts of different uh, uh, little embeddable devices. Um, the idea is that you can just throw data into the data drop from anywhere. So for example, within our own company, whenever we put up a form, um, uh, we're throwing data from that form into data drop. And the point is that what, what happens is when you've thrown data into data drop uh, within Wolfram language, you get a data bin. And so, for example, I could look up what data bins I have. Okay, here are a bunch of data bins I have. So let's say, um, 
I don't know, here's a, here's a thing from um, sensors, a uh, little sensor that I have on my desk. So we can say something like date list plot of that data bin. Um, and now uh, this will retrieve the data from that data bin from the cloud. And then in this case, because I'm running on the, on the desktop here, um, it'll now go and, um, and show me, hopefully, some um, date list plots of data from, from that particular data bin. I don't know why it's taking so long to retrieve. It's usually faster than this. Um, but, uh, oh, there we go. Okay, so this was you know, humidity, pressure, whatever, temperature. These are a bunch of time series. I can now just pick up these time series and manipulate them uh, directly using Wolfram language functionality. This is a super convenient thing because it just allows you to, to connect sort of real world objects uh, and put their data directly into, into the language. Um, and there's the notion of a data signature where we're using our natural language understanding stack to be able to take in data and interpret things in terms of what units it's in or if it's a geolocation or if it's a date or something like this. Okay, another thing that's coming uh, is our data repository. We've been talking about this for a couple of years, but it's finally uh, going to be arriving soon. Um, the idea of this is that we will be able to have um, uh, resource objects which are kind of universal lumps of data that will exist globally in our cloud. Um, and uh, we'll be able to, you'll be able to send things to the data repository and then they will be able to be available either to everybody publicly or to spec specified collections of users. It's, it's leveraging our kind of general cloud infrastructure to provide a way to distribute um, different kinds of data uh, to people. Another thing that's coming is what I've been calling compute back links. So when you deploy something, for example, let's say you take a, a piece of graphics, let's say we just take a random piece of graphics like this, and we say cloud deploy that, um, uh, let's cloud deploy this thing, then it'll just show up as a web page, it'll show up as something on a web page, you can embed that thing from your web page. Um, that's hopefully, oh, it's, it's a live object, I think. Um, this particular thing is some kind of live object. Okay, there we go. Anyway, so you, you can embed this on a, on a web page, um, and uh, uh, what will happen is that you will have, uh, you'll be able to automatically get it to include a source link so that anybody who sees that on a web page, let's say it's in a, a scientific article or something like this, will be able to click the source link, go back to the notebook that created that particular graphic, and then potentially, if the raw data that underlay that graphic is in the data repository, go back from the source notebook to a resource object in the data repository and go find the raw data and be able to do their own computations from it. So to me, this is an interesting, it's sort of data-backed publication. I think it's, uh, it's the, it has to be the way of the future. It's been supposed to be the way of the future for a long time, um, but there really haven't been uh, streamlined uh, tools to make it possible. I think we now have that with our cloud, particularly with some of the open cloud initiatives that we have and so on. Um, it will be very easy for people to add these kind of uh, compute backlinks, these source links, um, to be able to show people where did that picture in that article come from and let them work with the data that it came from. Well, okay, lots of, uh, lots of things happening in other parts of our world. System Modeler, there's a new version of System Modeler. We're doing a lot of work to integrate System Modeler into Wolfram Language so that um, we will be working on, uh, just as we've been curating uh, things from um, numerical properties of things to images um, to other kinds of things, we'll also be curating um, uh, uh, types of devices um, and specifications of devices so that one will be able to run these simulations uh, within Wolfram Language and author them in System Modeler. Okay, other things that are coming. Another area that will be coming is uh, so PubSub technology, uh, notion of channel brokers and channel framework. So one of the issues is if you've got a um, uh, a Wolfram language kernel and you want it to talk to somebody else's Wolfram language kernel interactively. You want, to, you want to have a chat session with them. How do you do that? Well, you will be able to do that using a thing we call the channel framework. You'll be able to open a channel, publish a channel, um, be able to give uh, an ID for a channel, and then the person at the other end can make a receiver for that channel, which, for example, if they trust the, the source of the channel, they'll be able to just execute code that comes across that channel. So you can, you can then set up, a, it's, it's rather trivial to set up a, you know, a chat session that's exchanging Wolfram language code and so on. And there are many other uses for this PubSub technology because the way we're doing it is really kind of an industry standard way of doing it so that you can communicate not only with other Wolfram language engines but also with other programs out in the world through this kind of two-way communication channel 
and we will, be, uh, we will support an efficient channel broker um, in our cloud infrastructure. Other things coming, a thing called Cloud Store, which is kind of uh, a way to uh, have databases that are um, uh, a very lightweight and efficient way to have databases operating in our cloud. Another thing that's happening is uh, Git Link. So internally, we, we use the Git um, uh, uh, versioning and source control system. Uh, we've built out a lot of technology for managing interactions with Git within Wolfram Language that will be being productized over the next six months or so um, and will be important for people who are doing large-scale development projects in Wolfram Language, being able to sort of symbolic, being able to analyze um, all sorts of uh, uh, commits and, and all kinds of things like this. Another thing that's coming is a lightweight local web server, um, not relevant for production, but highly relevant for development, uh, where you can actually, from within, uh, you have a, a Wolfram uh, engine kernel, and you're, you're directly specifying functions, and you're able to immediately run them in a web server that, that um, is on your machine. Another thing that's coming is marketplace. So when people build uh, forms, APIs, other pieces of code, uh, we will have a streamlined marketplace, uh, essentially app store, uh, where people can, um, uh, can get these things both for free and uh, with payment. Um, we're generally working to sort of integrate with everything. So for instance, I don't know, here's, a, here's an integration, um, maybe if I can show it to you. This is, a, this is an integration with Google Docs. Um, so here we can go ahead and say, open a Wolfram Alpha sidebar here. Okay, so we've got some kind of, um, Let's say we say um, uh, some random thing here. Um, we can do a computation, hopefully. Come on, wake up. Um, there we go. And we can just take that picture and drag it over here. Um, no, we can't. Well, so much for that. Um, that's very weird. I wonder what happened there. Um, it should have just appeared in the, in the um, uh, hmm. well, I don't know how to use Google Docs, so. Uh, that um, Okay, so that, that you can also do things like if you want to, let's say we say a thousand factorial here, you can say up here, you can say send that to uh, Wolfram Language, and this should be able to just run that computation using essentially a Google Docs uh, document as a front end for the system. Uh, you can also do the same thing in, um, uh, in the Google spreadsheet. Uh, perhaps you'll be able to do the same kind of thing in um, Excel, type spreadsheets and so on. Um, that's, uh, that's another thing that's happening. Another kind of connector, very different part of the world, is to Scratch. Uh, Scratch is an educational programming language that does very simple things. There will be uh, things called Wolfram blocks in Scratch, where you can make a, a block that executes uh, a piece of Wolfram language code um, that will be available through the, the, the Scratch uh, marketplace. Another kind of connection that's coming is to 3D printing. Um, we've been doing a lot of work in computational geometry, and that will come to fruition in the ability uh, to be able to work out what is printable. Given a piece of 3D geometry, is it printable in a particular piece of technology? And then being able to automatically connect to various printing services um, to do it. Another thing that we have done quite a bit of work on, with, but we're still exploring, is using uh, things like the Unity game engine as a front end to Wolfram Language, um, where you can uh, have definitions in Wolfram Language and have them essentially rendered uh, through something like a game engine. Another um, area, uh, we've been doing lots of work on external services. So being able to link external services, whether it's um, Archive, the Archive database of preprints, or whether it's Yelp, um, or whether it's uh, you know, Google Calendar or something, um, being able to link these things into Wolfram Language. Um, and really, we have sort of two levels of, uh, of integration. One is what we call connected services, where you know you're using somebody else's API, um, and you're, but you're doing uh, computations with it, let's say, to open library or something like this. Another thing is what we call integrated services, um, where, you're, uh, where you're actually, um, uh, um, where you're doing a computation where the, um, okay, where, where you do, for example, a web search, and this is using an external API, but the results are just coming directly back into Wolfram Language. So I can do you know, something like a web image search, um, sort of a useful thing. This is not yet available. This will be available soon. 
um, I don't know, I could do a web image search of ostrich, for example, and I could get, let's go ahead and get out of that, let's get the, um, uh, uh, the, the thumbnails of that um, for, um, so we should get a, a collection of ostrich pictures. Okay, there we go. And just for fun, we can, um, let's, let's get those. Let's say we, just, just for fun, let's try seeing what happens if I just say image identify all those pictures. Um, so but anyway, this is running, okay, so interesting. Sometimes, it's, uh, sometimes it gives something more specific, sometimes it comes to something less specific. I wonder whether they are actually pictures of ostriches. It was just the web, so we, it's hard to know. Um, uh, but in any case, this is, um, so this is an example of an integrated service where you just type web image search and we go deal with the sort of transaction with the API. Um, this will get billed to your cloud account um, if it's using an external API that, that um, uh, costs something. Other kinds of things of that kind, there's a send message, there's a message sending API which allows you to send text messages um, and so on directly from within the language. Um, uh, that's uh, another example. Okay, other things that are coming, uh, kernel connection manager. This has to do with being able to uh, start from a single Wolfram engine, being able to start a whole array of other Wolfram engines. That's relevant for our high performance computing uh, capabilities and also for dealing with Internet of Things devices where you'll be able to say remote, exec uh, remote evaluate across a whole bunch of machines some particular thing. Let's say you could remote evaluate current image and get back a list of pictures that have been captured from lots of little uh, devices out in the world. Um, the, um, the thing that we're doing with, um, we're trying to build out an HPC product where you'll be able to take a computation that you're doing in Wolfram language and run it in the cloud. Uh, probably the initial product will allow up to 128 cores at a time. Maybe we will go to 1,024 cores. Um, and that will spin up essentially immediately. You'll be able to just do a computation, let's say, on a desktop or in the cloud and immediately say, run this in parallel across 128 cores, and it will just immediately happen. Um, and that's, uh, uh, um, that's, that's something that's coming. Um, I've been waiting to be able to sort of do instant parallel computation forever. Um, I think we're finally going to be able to have it. Sort of at the other end of the spectrum from sort of the supercomputer world is embedded computation. Um, as many of you may know, Wolfram Language has been bundled on the Raspberry Pi computer uh, for the last uh, couple of years. Um, and uh, we are working towards um, uh, a bunch of other kinds of embedded solutions. Um, in particular, we are considering building a kind of a, a custom Wolfram box um, that's actually a, a tiny computer that boots directly in Wolfram language, where Wolfram language is the shell for the computer. Um, and one of the things that that allows us to do is to standardize the sensor package um, on the system so that we can, uh, so that we, we just know this thing that just booted up has these sensors on it. In particular, we're interested in working on sensor fusion where we have a small number of broad spectrum sensors and we've been trying to develop kind of the network of, there are about 10,000 kinds of things you can measure. We know that because we've uh, enumerated all of them for Wolfram Alpha and for our unit system in Wolfram language. And the question is of those 10,000 kinds of things you can measure, how many of them can be deduced? If you have camera data, you have some chemical uh, data, you have uh, sound data and so on, can you deduce uh, different kinds of, of measurements from these kind of uh, set of primitive broad spectrum measurements? So that's kind of an adventure that's a combination of physics and machine learning to try and deduce lots of different things from a small number of primitive measurements. Um, that's something that we hope to be able to build into this Wolfram Box system. Um, uh, that's, a, that's sort of a, 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 a different direction. Another thing I might mention, um, APIs. So you can create your own custom API in Wolfram Language extremely easily. You just cloud deploy an API function. As I mentioned, you can also do local deployments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we're, we're going to have a whole portfolio of our own APIs. Um, uh, one of them is built-in function APIs. So that will be thousands of APIs that are basically convenient ways to access individual Wolfram Language functions. So you, know, you want matrix eigenvalues. Uh, you want to make some plot. Um, those are, if those are individual Wolfram language functions, they'll just be an API that lets you call that individual Wolfram language function in a convenient way. And those APIs will be available both as web APIs, things like shell APIs, APIs available from like spreadsheets, things like this, and also APIs that are available from language libraries so that they'll be just essentially a, a, a language library in a language like JavaScript or something that allows you to directly call the eigenvalues function in Wolfram language. One way to call the eigenvalues function will be calling out to our cloud 
Another way to call that eigenvalues function, if you have it, is to use a local Wolfram engine if you, if you have one of those set up on your machine. So that's um, another type of API that we're planning of what we're currently calling dead simple APIs, um, which are APIs that are specific for specific functionality, like for example, doing image identification, uh, where basically it's a very minimal API where you just you feed it an image, it does its thing, it tells you a string back that gives you the result. That turns out to be something that a lot of people want from us, and we're going to standardize a kind of uh, a family of dead simple APIs for doing that. Okay, in terms of, of um, our own core development efforts, one of the big emphases right now is on uh, uh, speed and compilation and deployability uh, uh, of uh, compiled systems. Um, and uh, we've made quite a bit of progress on that. Um, uh, there's a lot of things that when you write big chunks of Wolfram language code, lots of things are very efficient right now, uh, but lots more things will become dramatically more efficient um, as this compilation technology comes in. Um, a sort of general trend for us is moving functionality uh, that we built kind of prototypes of in Wolfram Alpha. Wolfram Alpha is a much less demanding environment than Wolfram Language. In Wolfram Alpha, you're basically you're typing some question and some report is generated, um, but you only just have to see that report once. In Wolfram Language, you can take whatever the result was and you grind it uh, forever, and so the, the kind of the, the standards are much higher for what has to happen. So a lot of things that we were able to sort of prototype, whether it's you know atomic spectra or something in Wolfram Alpha, does fine if you're just looking at a picture on the screen. But by the time you're grinding it in great detail, um, it, you have to hold it to a higher standard. We've been doing a lot of work, kind of moving functionality from the almost prototype phase of Wolfram Alpha, but still very usable, to the the fully integrated uh, Wolfram language um, uh, mode. Other kinds of things, I mean, we're, we're just, there's a lot of stuff that is being, like here's a new function in, um, uh, in version 10.3, host lookup, that's looking up IP addresses, lots of systems level stuff that we need. One of the things that we've been doing as a company is to try and move all of our internal systems onto Wolfram language, uh, into Wolfram language, um, including all of the things that we use for monitoring all of our internal systems, all of our ERP systems, all these kinds of things into Wolfram Language. And this is a great way for us to drive development of, um, uh, uh, of lo lots of kinds of aspects of language, as well as to generate lots of uh, interesting new sort of spin-off products. Well, another direction I might mention uh, we started a while ago is to try and take pure mathematics and to try and take w within Mathematica, we've, I think, been very successful at sort of automating a lot of applied mathematics. We're also now interested in doing the same kind of thing for pure mathematics. And so the, the question is, how do, we, how do we describe the world of, of, um, uh, of, of pure mathematics um, in, um, uh, in our kind of terms? So this is an example of something we're doing along those lines. This is now a type of entity, a function space. And so you've got these very abstract kinds of function spaces. I don't know, let's pick one of these. Um, let's take something popular. Let's take one of these Lebesgue spaces. Let's take that one, for instance. Let's say this, and let's ask for the property. Um, so this will now give some properties of this space. Um, and we can start to see places where there's, uh, you know, uh, integration over a measure space and so on. These are kinds of pure mathematical concepts. The, the idea is to try and take those pure mathematical concepts and cast them into Wolfram language form. I think it's going to take probably to cover sort of all the reasonable areas of pure mathematics, it's probably going to take another thousand uh, built-in functions and it's going to take all kinds of design and so on. Uh, we've been sort of working with uh, various parts of the, of the world mathematics community on this uh, a thing which we're calling the Math Heritage Project to try to sort of take all the knowledge that's in the three million published theorems of mathematics and try to put it in computable form. Uh, we actually have a workshop that we're uh, organizing sometime early next year to, to start trying to go through this process of doing the sort of the, the standardized language design for mathematics um, to be able to encode all that knowledge in that way. So other kinds of things we're doing, um, a uh, lot more emphasis on machine learning and AI. We've been building up um, our capabilities in that area. Something that's coming soon is, um, in addition to image identify, image cases, which means show me all, find out all the cats in this image, where are they? 
um, those kinds of things. We have some efficient algorithms for that now. That's something very useful in practice. Um, another thing, image identifiers about nouns. Uh, here's an object in this picture. We're also interested in adjectives and verbs. Here is a, a you know, green cat, uh, you know, catching a ball or something. Um, this is uh, being able to understand how to describe uh, sort of real world situations um, in a kind of symbolic way. Um, this is a, a sort of upcoming challenge I've been working quite a bit on. I think it's, it's sort of interesting because the, a lot of work that's been done on this was done in like the 1600s and not a lot has been done since then of trying to, in that time there was a sort of idea of developing philosophical languages which would be sort of symbolic descriptions of the world. Um, we're back to trying to do that again. Um, but now we can actually, when we do it, we can actually implement it. Well, been doing um, lots of uh, product development. Also, the, um, uh, our Wolfram Solutions business unit um, that does uh, uh, services and consulting and so on has been growing and uh, doing a lot of very interesting things, um, doing a lot of work for particularly large companies. And there'll be a bunch of deployments of our stuff in, in sort of very consumer-facing uh, places over the next uh, uh, six months or a year um, that, that have been built um, by our solutions group. Um, on, on the education side, let's see, we've been doing oh, all kinds of things. We've been, many of you may know, we've had a, a summer school that we've been running for about 14 years now, um, which, uh, and we've been, that has been, uh, let's see, I had a picture. I had a picture, but it was in, it's in a Tumblr site, and for some bizarre reason, Tumblr seems to be, let's take a look, see whether it's working. No, Tumblr is losing all of its CSS this morning for reasons that I have no idea about. So much for using some, so much for, for <laughs> saving time by using an external service to, um, uh, to do something. Okay, in any case, the, um, let's see what I can get here. Uh, maybe I've got a picture here, let's see what this is. Yeah. So um, this was just, uh, what is this? That was a summer camp. Let's see. Is that, um, maybe this is just, um, yeah, it's just, this is just some sample projects from our um, uh, summer school this year. Um, and it's, it's, it's sort of interesting. We had about 70 students this year from around the world. Um, and sort of everybody gets to do a, uh, a unique project. Um, typically, ultimately, um, uh, the project concept ends up be getting developed by me. Um, but uh, the, the result was, is, is, some, is, is a lot of interesting projects which serve as, uh, as interesting prototypes for other things that we're doing. Um, so one of the things we're trying to do, so we have a, a summer school which is for sort of general undergraduates, graduate students, a few other kinds of people. Uh, we also have a, a summer camp for high school students um, that also has been very successful and that we're kind of planning to franchise out um, uh, to other locations and so on. Um, the, um, one of the things that we've been doing also, we've been developing a kind of mentorship program for high school students, college students, and others, um, people working with R&D folk within our company on projects that we think are interesting, that they think are interesting too. This is a website that may exist soon, which is kind of a summary of a bunch of projects that we're interested in um, that uh, so far mostly have been invented by me. But, but um, uh, the, the, these are all things which we care about and we'd, um, uh, uh, we'd, um, we'd like to see uh, somebody help us with. And so we have a, a program of working with, um, uh, with students on these kinds of projects. Um, which I think has been, um, uh, we've just been getting started the last few months. Um, another, another thing that, um, there are lots of kinds of educational things going on. Another venue that's sort of interesting is live coding. There's, uh, we've been using this livecoding.tv platform for uh, just the Wolfram language is sort of a, a great language to just do live coding in because things actually happen every minute or so um, in, uh, when you're doing Wolfram language computations. Um, and so that's, uh, that's sort of becoming a thing as a, as a version that's some kind of combination of entertainment and education. Well, okay, lots of, lots of stuff here. Um, I think, um, yeah, I just want to say quickly, and I'm probably really way over time, Where's Danielle? Danielle usually is, is um, 
Um, so, well, the thing that's coming in the very near future is, the, is our open cloud. That will start to exist in a few weeks. As I said, the thing we're particularly excited about there is sort of opening up programming and development in the way that we've tried to open up computational knowledge with Wolfram Alpha. Um, but in a sense, we are just providing the platform. And uh, what we need to do now is to show people how to use our technology stack in lots of different areas. And this is where kind of the community, which means in part you guys and so on, come in. So a question is, you know, what kinds of things can people do? Well, one thing you do is start a company, if you haven't already done so. The, the, uh, there are lots of opportunities. Um, building on our technology stack, there, there will be a period of time that will last a few years when there's a lot of easy stuff to be done that now is possible that we're not going to do because our company's focus is on building tools, not on building uh, specific and deliverable kinds of things. You can also just build an app or build a website, uh, put things in our marketplace, put things in the data repository, uh, you know, tell people what you're doing. Our community, uh, Wolfram community, has been um, continuing to grow and prosper. Um, the, uh, um, the thing that, um, where is it? It's, um, uh, oh, there we go. Um, the, uh, um, we um, also, uh, things like doing sessions about uh, what can be done with, with uh, Wolfram Language and so on at, at uh, conferences in specialized areas, giving workshops at, in, in those kinds of settings. Um, those, are, those are really good things to do. Um, we've been, uh, there have been an increasing number of meetup groups that have been starting up around Wolfram Language in different places around the world. Um, we have kind of a kit for helping people to start meetup groups. Um, we have a, a collection of student ambassadors at, at various universities. Uh, we're interested in recruiting more of those and in having professors and such like work with those student ambassadors. Um, also there are, um, Wolfram Language seems to be becoming a very popular thing for hackathons. A bunch of people have won hackathons recently. Look at that, all these, so oh, these are recent notable wins. Okay, that's great. Um, uh, from um, uh, um, using Wolfram Language technology. And so another thing that people who are more experienced can do is to be a mentor for, for hackathons. Um, the, uh, uh, another thing I, I should mention um, is uh, there is, a, there is, uh, there are a, an increasing number of companies that are looking for Wolfram Language programmers. Um, and something that we've been, uh, uh, we're, we're trying to have an area on the community for this. Also, well, our own company is expanding, but there are plenty of different geographies, uh, sort of types of companies, industries, and so on, uh, where there is an increasing demand for Wolfram Language programmers. And we're trying to figure out how best to set up the right kind of uh, marketplace for Wolfram Language programmers uh, our human resources group is actually uh, going to be doing work with outside people as well, um, trying to help connect companies that want Wolfram Language programmers with people who know Wolfram Language programming and, and want to work for those companies. I think there's some, right now, for example, I know of a bunch of very interesting opportunities, both with startup companies and with established and large companies uh, who are trying to build uh, Wolfram technology-based systems and need Wolfram Language programmers. And um, our, our HR group, as I say, is, is, is we're both going to be doing sort of publicly visible things in the community and confidential kinds of things for, for people interested in, in those kinds of opportunities. Um, I just want to mention again, uh, in terms of things people can do, you know, write a book. You know, books, I thought books may be, might be completely obsolete, but the great thing about a book is there's sort of a certain finiteness to what's there, and people kind of know what to expect if you say it's a book about this, they know it's a certain, certain volume of information and a certain kind of, uh, uh, of contained um, uh, way of presenting it. Uh, we are going to be publishing a bunch of books. We have a publishing operation, Wolfram Media, uh, which published, uh, well, the, the um, uh, long ago published Mathematica book, New Kind of Science, Mathematica Journal, et cetera. More recently, it published a book, The Hands-On Guide to Mathematica, just came out like a month ago. Uh, written by a group of people in our sales organization um, that's, that's doing really well. Um, the basic deal will be, uh, we, we're, not, we're more interested in getting the content of these books out than we are in, for example, making money from publishing books. Um, and so our, our uh, thing is we'll, we'll help people 
who are where, uh, where we're interested in the topic and, and we sort of accept the original proposal for the book will help people to develop the book, um, then uh, we will put out a sort of free web version of the book and then the printed book, the e-book, the licensed versions of the book and so on, we'll split 50-50 the proceeds of that with, with the author of, uh, of the book. And we, we would like to see books about uh, a, a huge diversity of different kinds of subjects, including very specialized kinds of things. Um, and I, I have to say that writing this book, I don't know what people will think of this book, but this book was very easy to write. Um, having written a book that was very difficult to write um, a, a dozen years ago, this book, the core of this book, took basically three weeks to write. Um, and uh, you know, it helped that I knew what I was talking about. At least I thought I knew what I was talking about. Um, the big problem with the, the previous book was I had to do all the research as well. And, and every time I ran into, like for example, writing the exercises has taken me longer than practically anything else here because I don't know anything about writing exercises. Um, but in any case, it's you know, writing a book about a thing you know about with Wolfram language is I think something with the, with the tools that we have is going to be rather easy and I think it's going to be, be very rewarding. Um, we also, I, I had, we've been developing uh, a course authoring system, um, which uh, uh, I was going to produce a course with about two years ago, and it didn't happen, um, but we are going to make this course authoring uh, tool available generally to people. Other kinds of things, I'm, I'm, I'm almost at the end here. I mean, there's just a lot of other kinds of things out there. Um, you know, very simple things that would be helpful to our uh, 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 to the world, actually, is taking Wolfram Language uh, and uh, Wolfram Alpha and open cloud kinds of things and linking them to things like Wikipedia. Um, we haven't done a lot of that. It's just not something that, as a company, we've, we've put much effort into. But there's just, there's, we know there's tens of thousands of pages in Wikipedia that should be pointing to things in Wolfram Alpha, should be pointing to things in demonstrations project should be pointed to things in the open cloud. Oh, by the way, the demonstrations project will soon be, be operating purely in the cloud. Um, other kinds of things people can, can help with, I mentioned code captions. If you know a language that isn't in the 15 that have already been, uh, uh, that we already have code captions translated for, we would be delighted to give you the, the, the material to, to translate uh, Wolfram language function names into, um, uh, uh, into your language. Um, companies, we're kind of interested in, uh, just as we're interested in mentoring individual students, we're interested in mentoring companies too. Uh, we've gotten involved in a whole bunch of different companies that are uh, doing things based on our technology stack. We want to have kind of a more organized operation that tries to help launch companies and um, that's, a, that's a different topic to talk about. Well, I should, I should wrap up. I, this, this is, as I say, we've been, we've been um, uh, uh, it's exciting for me that, that all these different things are happening right now, all these things that we've worked towards for a really long time are, are coming together and they're sort of uh, vast new areas for us and vast new classes of users that are getting opened up. Um, and I have to say, our, our company, even though it's nearly 30 years old, uh, continues, to, as everybody is, keeps on reminding me, continues to feel very much like a startup in its operation because we're, we're doing all this new stuff all the time. Um, and uh, anyway, I hope that, uh, 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 I hope that, the, as I said, I think there are just some great opportunities at this point for our community and for taking the things that a lot of people have put lots of effort into over the course of many years and really making them much more broadly accessible. And I hope you guys will be able to be involved in that. And thank you very much. And I'm sorry I went so long.